On this edition of Mississippi Roads, we'll be traveling back in time. A Jackson artist expresses her vision to the world. A group of folks down in Jasper County are cooking up a recipe for homemade cane syrup. And we hop down to Pascagoula to grab a bite at Ed's Drive-In. Mississippi Roads is made possible in part by the generous support of viewers like you. Thank you. Support for the arts segment of Mississippi Roads comes from the Mississippi Arts Commission, whose mission is to be a catalyst for the arts and creativity in Mississippi. Information available at arts.state.ms.us. Down Mississippi Roads. Now, welcome back to Mississippi Roads. I'm your host, Walt Grayson. And this week, we're going back in time. Well, it sure seems like it anyway. Actually, we're at Landrum's Country Homestead and Village, just outside Laurel. Landrum's Homestead and Village is located about five minutes off Interstate 59 on Highway 15. When you show up, the first thing you'll notice is how quiet it is here. None of the sounds of the everyday life we've become accustomed to. No TVs in the background. No humming air conditioner, just you and nature, like it used to be. And that's for a reason. The Landrums have built 70 or so buildings here, each one of them showing a slice of life that our ancestors lived before the invention of many modern conveniences we're used to today. If you've ever wondered, what was life like back before computers, smartphones, TVs, even electricity? Well, the homestead sets out to answer that question. It's a testament to what working with your hands used to be like back when it meant washing clothes by hand, or making your own soap, or building your own home. Out of the 70 different buildings found here, there are cabins, a general store, a blacksmith shop, a barn, a barber shop, even a chapel. And all of these buildings were built by the Landrum family. Hey, while we're talking about working with our hands, let's visit Jackson artist Ginger Williams, who uses brush strokes instead of well-placed logs to create her art. Picasso said something to the effect of, you know, all kids draw or create, um, and then some just don't stop. For Ginger Williams Cook, being an artist proved to be more than a childhood dream. I chose to do art as a major because I didn't think I could make any money doing theater, which I don't know why I thought I could make money being an artist, but I tried it anyway. I was about 20, and so I was kind of right in the middle of college, and I decided I didn't really want to do art anymore. Then I lost my mother. I was so kind of emotionally distraught in, in the grieving process that being an art major is kind of what saved me in a sense. Getting into 2005 and 2006, um, I realized that I had started showing work in you know, these major cities that I thought that that's where you had to go to be an artist or become famous, kind of just dreaming about what I wanted to do. My opinions changed on what it meant to become an artist and to actually just be an artist. There I was my senior year of school already making some money, which I didn't think was a possibility. My family always was, well, what's your fallback plan? What's your fallback plan? And I reared my head at that. I was like, this is just ridiculous. I'm not gonna have a fallback plan. I'm going to be an artist. A professor once told me that you don't have to move to New York or LA to become an artist. You just go where there's a creative heartbeat. You find a creative pulse. Ginger found that pulse in Jackson's Foundry District, where she and several other artists formed a bond. We were all always kind of feeding off each other artistically and doing our own personal things as well as collaborating. Maybe just even just throwing ideas around at each other and stuff. So we fed off each other's energy. She's definitely been a leader um, and inspired, I would say, several people to, um, you know, just go for it. William had moved into Fondren Corner Building, so it kind of became the hub, at least our kind of base of operations, just as friends. Everybody would hang out there in William's place usually and in William's studio there in Fondren Corner Building. I really think that the friends that I've made have really 
taken my life to a really great journey, I'd say. <laughs> it's like the incredible journey. She is like a creative sister to me. I think too many people believe that it's all in where you go to school that makes you the artist. And that's not true. It's really, at the end of the day, everyone's self-taught in a way. is self-motivation. There were several abstracts that she did that were that were really, really strong, and then her her figurative her figurative work, where she has these distorted, you know, um, female figures to very realistic portraits. Um, it's all kind of it's pretty amazing that all of these different kind of works can come from from one person. I really like to apply my skills in different ways. Um, and I started noticing a pattern that I became more, um, like I'm a seasonal artist. Like I like to do something completely different in the summer than I do in the winter. And so the seasons actually affect me as an artist. In the winter, I like to do a lot of illustration of kind of characters out of my mind. They're called grotesque forms, but grotesque sounds like such a scary, horrible word. I draw throughout the year. I, I keep a sketchbook and I'm always drawing uh, different things and I never had any doubt that drawing was second nature and something that I just couldn't help. But when I had my baby, four hours after having her, I was in this delirious state and I don't really remember it, but I asked for my sketchbook and I was holding her and I drew her four hours after having her. This painting that I did, I did for my daughter's nursery. And when I found out that I was having a girl, I wanted to paint a big painting above her crib. And Wizard of Oz is one of my favorite stories of all time. It's really highs and lows a lot of times. There doesn't seem to be too much of a happy medium, which is good because it keeps you refreshed, it keeps you on your toes, it keeps you, um, you know, being honest. I think that's what I, I, I try really hard to do, is to be honest. Along the way, Ginger's quest to express herself through her artwork has taken some quirky and whimsical turns. I had some nesting dolls that I hadn't painted before. Like, I tried one idea and it didn't work, and I was like, gosh, I have to do this five times or six times. It was just really hard to kind of keep coming up with something on each one. And so I was like, okay, I have five. What do I do? And so I thought, oh, I can paint the Jackson Five. And I had so much fun doing it, it being pop culture. And I laughed and smiled doing each one. I was like, okay, I'm gonna put glitter on the microphone. And, and I felt like a kid playing all of a sudden, you know? Then from there, I was like, well, what's next? And I put the Jackson 5 dolls on Facebook. People just commented and liked it and just, it became exciting and fun. If you work hard at what you do, you will be rewarded in one form or another, and uh, that the payoff should just be that you get to do what you love to do, and you fight for what you want to do. When Tom Landry built this first cabin more than three decades ago, he had no idea that it would eventually turn into this sprawling village. He just wanted to teach the grandkids how things used to be done a long time ago, when they built houses board by board. But after the family filled it with some of their antique furniture, they realized the cabin was only the starting point. And it didn't hurt that Mr. Landrum had been running a successful business for a while, making pine furniture. In fact, that pine furniture business was what helped them get the idea to keep going. And what was to later become an annual tradition of having a get-together on the first weekend after Thanksgiving, Mr. Landrum got a bunch of people together, family, friends, people who had bought his furniture, and invited them to see him raise the roof, literally, on the cabin. And later on, those who had come to see the roof raising would ask him if he had plans to make another building. So. 
He made another, and then another, until now, 70 buildings later, the Landrum's homestead has become a bit of an attraction, to put it mildly. But Landrum's homestead doesn't have a monopoly on keeping old traditions alive. Just right up the road in Jasper County, we ran across a group of folks who take making cane syrup and turn it into a community event. There are several elements involved in making cane syrup, but the most important one is time. It just takes time. It's an all-day process to boil 120 gallons of cane juice down to about 15 or so gallons of syrup. It's a lot of water to have to boil away. And you have to get the cane first, and that takes time. Time to go to the cane field and strip and cut the cane. It takes some helpers who have the time to put in to help you, too. Leo Beatty of the Lewin community in Jasper County has, as his help, friend and neighbor Larry Smith of Lewin, and syrup maker Toby Taylor of Morton, and Toby's father, Buddy Taylor. Leo uses a century-old tool to strip the cane while it's still standing in the field. They don't make these cane strippers anymore, but they're pretty indispensable to anyone cutting sugar cane. Strip it while it stands, then cut out the top and stack it on the wagon. And then do that same thing over and over again several thousand times before the season is over, before you've harvested all the sugar cane in the patch. There's nothing in the sugar making process that is new. Raising cane, cutting it, and then crushing it to get out all the sweet sap in the middle. Now there are improved ways of doing that, but nothing new. Now, for instance, the cane mill that Leo uses to crush the cane once belonged to his grandfather and was powered by a mule. A long pole on the top of the mill was hooked to the mule, and the mule would walk in continuous circles all day long as someone fed the cane into the crusher. All day long. The juice would be collected and conveyed to the cooker. And Leo has modernized his mill to run off an electric motor, and another electric motor runs a conveyor belt that catches the crushed cane and carries it away from the mill where it piles up. Leo walked by this mill all of his life, and his daddy used to tell him stories of how his granddaddy made syrup with the cane mill back in the old days. And those stories stuck with Leo, and what you see here today at his syrup making complex out behind his house near Lewin is a product of those stories. If it hadn't been for daddy's stories about them making syrup, the cane mill would probably still be sitting right where it's been since the early 1900s. It takes a while to squeeze out the 120 gallons that Leo needs for one cooking to fill his syrup kettle. Now, making syrup in a kettle is new to some people, but this is the really old way that people used to make syrup before the days of the long, narrow evaporator pan. The kettle originally started out as a wash pot. Then they found out that whenever they made syrup and it boiled up, it boiled out of the, out of the wash pot. So they put a lip on it, and then they started calling it a sugar kettle. Some people refer to, to it as just kettle cooking, but uh, it's come a long way. It predates the evaporator pan by decades. Even as the raw juice is filling the cooker, people show up out of nowhere to watch or to take home a jug of juice if there's any left after the kettle is full. Anytime someone's making syrup, it draws a crowd. And of course, word will spread uh, from various sources uh, that I'm cooking syrup and people will come by just to see it, come by to taste, drink some of the juice, uh, reminisce about the old days when they can remember when their parents or grandparents were cooking syrup. It was just, it's a time people get together and remember the past. John Ashley from Brandon dropped by with some of his friends and remembers helping his granddaddy make syrup. I remember a lot about it. I remember there were mules pulling the, the grinder and I remember uh, down the hill that there was a cooker and my granddaddy was in charge of the juice and my job was to keep the mules going and to keep the chain the cane chews away. 
Another modern refinement Leo has incorporated into a syrup making is a gas fire. When they used to, the cooking would be fired with wood, and some people still use wood. But a gas fire is a lot easier to regulate. And syrup making is a temperamental process that takes finessing so it doesn't scorch. And the valve on a gas flame is a lot easier to manage than throwing on or taking off logs in a wood fire. You notice the difference in the size of the bubbles? And once the kettle is full and the fire is going full blast, there's little else to do but skim off the impurities as they float to the surface as it boils and let the conversation thread its way from topic to topic for the next few hours. Two, no ketchup. One. No onions. I can get on that dead lane bicycle and learn how to drive, and I run into every tree they want me on. <laughs> I couldn't stop, I couldn't dodge a pine tree for nothing. <laughs> Has that ever happened to anybody here? Uh, no, you're the only one. It's going to be thinner than what I cooked in the ridge. Uh, I, I mean, really, that rabbit was at least three feet off the ground, not four. The boiling juice goes through several stages as it cooks thicker and thicker. Each stage has its own look and its own smell. It hadn't made that transitional smell yet, though. No, it's still green. Some syrup makers go by how the syrup sheets as it gets thick to determine when it's ready. But Leo Beatty's a little more scientific and a little more consistent with his syrup. He tests it with a hydrometer. 34. Got one more to go. Two. Two. And we ain't going 36. You're not? Uh-huh. Not quite. It's right at the top of 35. Mm -hmm. Got to go to the mm -hmm. bottom. Mm -hmm. Look. And then finally, the last reading. And Leo says, It's syrup. And after the declaration that it is syrup, the fire goes out, the dippers come out, and the boiled down contents of the syrup kettle gets one more straining as it goes into the container from which the jars are filled. This cooking of 120 gallons of cane juice boiled down to 18 and a half gallons of syrup. Over 100 gallons of liquid was turned to steam and boiled away during the day. And it's been a long day from the time when the team started out this morning in the cane field until the final product is poured over some fresh biscuits. But at the end of the day comes the sweet reward, not only in a good yield of syrup, but in the sweet taste of satisfaction that comes only after a long day's work of putting in the time it takes to make a good jar of Mississippi cane syrup. Ah, boy. There you go. Dead eye. At Landrum Homestead, there's always something to do. There's wagon rides, there's a trail that you can walk and get up close and personal with nature, the gym mine, butter churning, all sorts of demonstrations. Matter of fact, on any given day, you're likely to find most anybody doing most anything from out of the past. A short walk over to the blacksmith shop. You can hear the ringing of hammer against metal as the man inside, the town blacksmith as it were, plies his trade. Nowadays, most everything is made in a factory, pressed by machines. But this is where it all started. Man's ability to forge raw materials into something useful something needed to survive. A few buildings down, there's a lady churning her own butter. And when students and visitors stop by, she's glad to let them take a try. It's hard work, but it's worth it because there's a reward at the end. They get to sample the butter they've just created. There's even an old gem mine where students can try their hands at panning for the good stuff. And a laser rifle range where sharp-eyed visitors can practice picking up bottles and cans of rats. But the grounds are so pretty here that sometimes modern traditions sneak in. Quite a few starry-eyed brides and grooms have exchanged their vows under the pecans and at the old chapel here on the grounds. Weddings and large groups can have Landrum's cater too. And for the day-to-day -day tourist, there's always snacks and refreshments. Hey, while we're talking about food, let's skip right down the road to Pascagoula and see why people are stopping by Ed's Drive-In. <laughs> Silly 
For over 60 years, Ed's Drive-In has been pleasing the palates of their customers with a menu that has truly stood the test of time. Good hot dogs. <laughs> Very good hot dogs. And milkshakes. The people, the food, you know, the culture, everything about it, you know. It's a, I wish there were one of these on every street corner, you know, instead of a McDonald's. Well, the chili, the chili is very unique. The menu is very limited. It's primarily hamburgers, cheeseburgers, chili cheeseburgers, which is the uh, biggest seller, hot dogs, various types, and another big seller is the milkshakes, which are handmade, not machine-made like everybody else. There are things uh, on the menu that aren't even on the menu. This is the Ed Special. It's not on the menu, and I suggest you try one. There's not much to say about it, but it's just great. Anything like that? Nothing like that. Fantastic. We didn't have to have it on the menu. It, it was known to the, to the locals enough so that they would order it when they wanted it. So I've got a special chili sauce on it and two patties. It's excellent. Yeah, it's not the, uh, the same chili that they use uh, on the regular chili cheeseburgers. It's got a little twist on it. So. The chili is based on a recipe that has been developed through the years that uh, uh, we have uh, not published by any means. A lot of people call it secret. It, it's really not, but uh, we don't broadcast it. While the recipe for Ed's chili may be a well-kept secret, the secret to the success of the restaurant is pretty clear, consistency. While other restaurants have focused on trendy menus and marketing gimmicks, Ed's has chosen to stay virtually as it was when it first opened. What separates Ed's is the menu that has been consistent for the last 50 some years. It's apparent that it's a very likable uh, menu, and it's been successful for all that time. A quite apparent success. The number of burgers sold to happy customers on any given day can be a staggering figure. On a good day, we get uh, a minimum of about 600 uh, hamburgers, cheeseburgers, and chili cheeseburgers combined. Times may have changed. Ed's drive-ins even changed hands a few times throughout the years. But there are two families in Pascagoula that are committed to keeping Ed's the same. I used to live a uh, few floral shop is right next door here. Uh, Mom and Daddy uh, originally started Pew's Floral Shop over 60-something years ago. I lived right behind the flower shop, so uh, we were right here, and our friends came to Ed's, and we congregated at Ed's, and so uh, uh, it's been a great experience. Such a great experience that Joe Martin Jr. and his brother-in-law, Walker Foster, decided to buy Ed's, thus creating a family business between the Walker and Martin families that would allow them to keep the tradition of Ed's drive-in alive, not only for themselves, but for the countless loyal customers that have been visiting Ed's since they were kids. When they were growing up, they came to Ed's with their parents. Now they're bringing their grandchildren and great-grandchildren and uh, the people that have moved away still come back. When they come home for the holidays, either for Thanksgiving or Christmas, Ed's is the first place they stop, and which is awesome. You know, that's tremendous. Uh, it says a lot for us and our product. and and what Don and Ed did uh, in years past. People want Ed's to stay like it is. I mean, obviously we've come forward a long way in technology and things like that, but I think people like uh, the Ed's that they know, uh, the simple menu, the, the low prices, uh, being able to come and drive up right here. And, uh, you know, so I, I think people want that to stay. We live in a fast paced world and, you know, it's uh, nice to come to a place like this where, you know, it just seems real. So if you need a break from those fast food kings and colonels, there's no need to make a run for the border. Just pass those golden arches by and head on down to Ed's Drive-In in Pascagoula, where their burgers, fries, and milkshakes are sure to remind you of a time long gone, but not forgotten. It's an old style uh, restaurant. We have good food, uh, good service. Uh, our menu is simple. Uh, we try to keep the cost down as much as we possibly can. I always tell people you can take twenty dollars and, and, and uh, feed your family when you come to Ed's. I'm not a man of many great words, but Ed's uh, 
Edge Drive-In is a great place. You know, I highly recommend if you're in Pascal, Mississippi, to stop here and you know get some of the great food and you know meet the great people. Ed's has remained the same the whole time, and will continue to as long as we own it. Well, there's one building that you're going to want to for sure see when you come to Landrum's Homestead because gravity works just a little differently in here than it does everywhere else. This is one place that it's not only fun to take part in, but it's a good photo op. And your friends will wonder how you did it, but of course they'll have to come here and see for themselves. And regrettably, that's all the time we have for the show. Now, if you've got any questions about anything you've seen, you can always contact us at mpbonline.org slash Mississippi Roads or join our Facebook page. We're going to leave you with some sights and sounds from around Landrum's homestead just outside of Laurel. Meanwhile, I'm Walt Grayson, and I'll be seeing you on Mississippi Roads. Roads is made possible in part by the generous support of viewers like you. Thank you.